Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. What we're going to look at in the next hour is a kind of programming that a lot of people don't think of it as such. We're going to show you how to get data out of databases. Increasingly, scientists are storing the information they work with in databases of various kinds instead of flat files living on disks. You don't have to know how databases are structured in order to pull things out. You certainly don't have to know as much as we're going to show you about how to mix and match data. But all of it helps. It allows you to do things that the creators of those systems didn't anticipate. And perhaps most importantly, knowing how to get data out will help you understand why things are structured the way they are. If you understand the limitations and capabilities of today's database systems, I think you'll have a better understanding of how to create databases of your own and why the databases you're working with are structured the way they are. Now, your instructor will have pointed you at this diagram. Please keep it open somewhere on your screen as we're going through the examples and exercises because this is our little database. And to explain it, I have to back up a little bit. When I say databases, I'm actually conflating two separate concepts. A database is a pile of data organized in some way. A database manager is a program that manipulates databases stored in that particular way. There are five that you care about in the world today. The two big commercial databases are Oracle from Oracle and DB2 from IBM. They have had tens of thousands of engineer years invested in them over the course of more than two decades. They are powerful, high-performance systems. They're very complicated and they're very expensive. They are the space shuttles and 747s of data management. There are two open source systems, one less open than the other. The one that most open source projects have traditionally used is called MySQL. Its status is a little bit problematic these days, so we're increasingly seeing people shift over to one that has actually been a cleaner and better engineered system all along, called Postgres. These days, if you want an open source industrial strength database, Postgres should be your first choice. All four of these are complicated to set up and administer. They give you a lot of power tools, but that comes with a price. The fifth database system that you probably care about, the one that we'll use in our examples, is called SQL Lite. SQL is the name of the language that you use for programming these kinds of databases. SQL Lite is the smallest implementation around of that standard. It was written by primarily one person, and it's meant to be small. It's not fast, it's not full featured, but it's very, very small. If you have a modern smartphone, the odds are that SQLite is what's being used to store things like your music playlists and your address book. It's been embedded in all sorts of other pieces of software, and you can use it on its own. As I said, it doesn't give you all the features of the big four. It certainly does not give you the performance of the big four, but it can still handle hundreds or thousands of operations per second, and you can move databases from one machine to another by moving a single file instead of having to go through a complicated process of export, package, move, unpackage, and import. The model that all five systems use is the relational model. Technically, they are relational database management systems, or RDBMSs. You can see why people just talk about them as databases. As you can see from the diagram, the way a relational database manager stores information is as a set of rectangular tables. The database is the collection of all of the tables. Each one of the tables has a fixed number of columns, but a variable number of rows. The columns are the fields in the records. For example, the person table has a login ID column called login, a column for the last name, and a column for the first name. The experiment table has project ID, the experiment ID, the number of people involved, the date of the experiment, and the hours that were spent on that experiment, and so forth. Those columns are fixed once you create the table. That's actually not true. There are ways to adjust them, but for all practical purposes, once you create the table, every single record in that table will have exactly and only those fields. 
The records hold the actual information in the table. For example, the person table currently has four records, one for Sofia Kovalevskaya, one for Mikhail Lomonosov, one for Dmitry Mendeleev, and one for Ivan Pavlov. We can add and delete rows, records, any time and any way we want. That is easy. Each record, however, has the same shape as all of the other records in the same table, and each table is uniquely identified by a name. So if I want to talk about the last name column of the person table that uniquely identifies this set of data and all of the entries in that column have the same type. They're all strings or they're all numbers or they're all dates or they're all floating point numbers or something. Each column has a particular type. These restrictions actually have a very solid grounding in theory. And databases are one of the places where computer science theory and computer science practice actually inform each other. Work done by people like C.J. Data in the 1970s led to this model. And there's a rich set of mathematics behind this about the relations that you can express, about associativity and transitivity rules so that you can reorder the operations you want to do to get higher performance, and so forth. And many, many people have gone off and done their PhDs or founded companies based on this model. It completely dominates commercial data processing. Now, today, over the last two or three years, we've seen a rise in alternatives. And there are many different kinds of alternatives, and they go under the name NoSQL, non-SQL databases. Some of them are running places like Google, because this model doesn't scale to that size of data. At least Google doesn't think it does. Oracle and IBM thinks it will. Others are meant to handle unstructured documents. Others are meant to handle graphs, nodes and arcs like friend relationships on Facebook and so forth. We still don't know which of those are going to succeed and which are going to fail, which ones are going to spread and which ones are going to wither on the vine. If you come back and do this course three years from now, I expect that we will be teaching you this and something else. But we're not going to teach you something else until we know which one is actually going to survive because it is useful. This is still the model used for almost all database systems, so this is the one you master first. Okay, let's come back to our terminals. Your instructors will have given you a file called experiments.db. So let's go into the version control the working copy of version control, and I've got that file experiments.db. I say SQLite 3 because we're using version 3. I want to open the database experiments.db. When I do that, it gives me a command prompt and I can start typing commands. This is exactly like the Unix shell. Instead of a dollar sign followed by Unix commands, I've got an SQLite prompt and I can start typing in SQL and it will show me the results of whatever operations I do. This is one of the many systems around that's modeled after the interactive shell. So, the very first thing I'm going to do is switch back to my diagram and say, all right, let's play around with the person table for a little bit. As I said, please keep this diagram open on your screen. Let's select, login, first name, last name, from person. This is an SQL command. Select is a keyword. It means I want to grab some data. I then tell you what fields I want and which table they're coming from. And what I get back is the values for all of the records that I asked for. Now, I could select in a different order. I could select last name, login, first name from person, and I'd get them back in that order. By default, SQL uses a vertical bar as a separator. You can change that to be a space, a tab, a comma, whatever you want. We'll just leave it at the default for now. Okay. If I want to get everything, I can just say select star. You may remember that star is a wild card in the Unix shell meaning match everything. Well, that same wildcard is used in many other places. Here's one example. Get me all of the columns from that table and all of the records. Okay, this shows me my data. 
And that's a very simple way to process, but there's a lot more I can do. What if I only want to get data for Sophia? I could say select star from person where login equals the string skull. I'm telling you the table, that's person. I'm telling you the condition, that's called a filter. We only keep those things that pass this test. We only keep those records that have a login ID equal to the string SKOL. And then, once I've got those records, I want to show all columns. And the order is important. Because I could do something like select last name from person where login equals skull. And this still works because I'm grabbing all of the rows and all of the columns from the table person. Then I'm throwing away every row where the login is not skull. I'm keeping the ones where the login is skull. So I'm filtering out rows based on the where. And then I'm deciding what to display based on the select. So my select can actually show me things that I'm not filtering on or vice versa. Okay, this gives me a way to zero in on particular records. What if I want to get last names for several person? Well, where login is in, skull, or mlom. Right? Here, it gets all of the rows and columns from the person table, and it keeps the ones where the login is in the set skull or mlom, and then it shows me their last names. What happens if I reverse the order of these? What happens if I say mlom skull? It gives me the answers in the same order I got last time. Relational database systems work with sets, and sets aren't ordered. We always have to show the output in a particular order. We have to print it to a terminal, for example. But when I show you this diagram, even though it looks that the rows are in a particular order, they aren't necessarily stored in that order. Even though the columns are shown in an order, they aren't necessarily stored in that order. The database system gets to decide the order in which to store things in order to make operations fast. If you want to force a particular order, you have to do that. So I could, for example, do this, order by last name, that ensures that no matter what order the records came in, they'll always be printed ordered alphabetically by last name. And I can in fact make this even more complicated and more useful by saying select last name from person where login is in scholar mlom order by last name descending. The desk means put them in reverse order. I could also do ask ASC for ascending to do them in ascending order. So if I want to guarantee an output order, that's on me. I have to do that. I tell you what order to put them in, by what field, and whether I want ascending or descending. Now as you can see, this is breaking the line. I'm now right up to the end of the line. As with the shell, I can break commands across lines. I could write this as select last name from person where login in skull or mlom order by last name descending. Notice here that as I break the line it gives me a different prompt to tell me the command's not over. The command isn't over until it sees the semicolon. SQL was designed in the 1960s like a lot of languages from that era statements have to end with a semicolon. C and Java programmers will have seen this and cursed it. You'll forget the semicolon and you'll wind up with something like select last name from person and you'll hit carriage return and you'll get this and it's expecting more input because it hasn't seen the end of the command. You need to give it a semicolon. That's all it's waiting for.